For if this is what you desire, I'm ready to melt you into one, and while you live, live a common life as if you were a single man, and after your death in the world below, still be one departed soul instead of two. I ask whether this is what you lovingly desire, question mark, and quote. And each agreed that this meaning and melting into one another, this becoming one instead of two, was the very expression of this ancient need. And the reason is that human nature was originally one, and we were a whole, and the desire or pursuit of this whole is called love, unquote. <clears throat> the homosexual love, which reunites the original masculine wholeness, according to Plato, is idealistic in essence, quote, selfless, and always turned to the maintenance of true education and virtue, generous and spiritually uplifting, unquote. Through this masculine love can be realized the ideals of wisdom, the good, the true, and the beautiful, and through these, quote, to become the friend of God and be immortal if mortal man may, unquote, as Socrates says. <coughs> On this basis was established a platonic code of true love, chivalrous and oriented to the heroic and sublime, the one true way to spirituality. And this code of ideal love can be followed along in literary and other artistic expressions from Plato's day to our own. The story of Gilgamesh, as we have seen, is also about the mystical idea of true love between two men. Just as the search for this ideal stands at the historical center of the modern gay male imagination, so then does the story of Gilgamesh root that search in the dawn of recorded time, more than 2,000 years before Plato. All those characteristics of the central metaphor outlined by Fone in his book, quote, the other self, the mirror image, the ideal friend, the manly comrade, the understanding soul, the understanding heart, and quote, describe and can do in relation to Gilgamesh and vice versa. Exactly. Their relationship is ideal, archetypal, made by the gods. It bestows on the lovers a godlike power, able to challenge the gods themselves. This is the, just the sort of incursion into the deity's jealously guarded domain that occurs in Plato's story of the primordial humans. They too challenge the gods, thus incurring Zeus's wrath. In the same way, Gilgamesh and Enkidu are split apart in punishment, as Enkidu is condemned to the netherworld. Likewise, Gilgamesh's regaining Enkidu at the end signifies his attaining to a degree of spiritual wisdom and productivity that Socrates says in the symposium is the result of pursuing gay romantic love. These parallels suggest how the story of Gilgamesh in the words of the book reviewer, quote, is pertinent to our times and speaks to a part of us that many have abandoned. It calls you back to your own beginnings and to ideals of true love of the man, unquote. <clears throat> The story of Gilgamesh roots today's experience of masculine romance in a very ancient world of mythic proportions, of monsters and gods and treasures. Thereby it gives shape to the divine, numinous quality experienced in romantic love between men. This love casts a fascination that entrances and seizes the personality, exerting a determinative attraction for the ego so touched which is, quote, pulled along, quote, to, quote, search for the other half, unquote. Such an encounter with the numinous occurs to Gilgamesh as well, but unlike in our own secularized day, the world of Gilgamesh is dominated by numinous powers, populated and plotted by deities and demons, suffused by and with the creative dynamic energy of divine spirit, which imparts an intelligent, animating force to all things, expressing the will of deity. Because of this, as the story of Gilgamesh unfolds, it reveals a spiritual world of meaning in romantic love, and so articulates the numinous in a way not easily available today. As the ancient Mesopotamians saw it, the material world was but a part, a smaller part, of a larger universe whose main substance and nature were spiritual, surrounding and interpenetrating, interpenetrating physical reality, there existed another lawfully dimensional world, as real as this material one, but transcendent and extraordinary. And this other world reality was the origin of deities and monsters, the source of the animating spirit, the father-mother of all. It is out of this other world that the gods send Enkidu, a star fallen from heaven, and it is into the other world 
that Gilgamesh must journey because of the ache in his belly. Just as the story of Gilgamesh cannot be understood except as a homosexual romance, so too it requires an appreciation of the numinous, the spirit world. Only in relation to the spirit world does the romance in Gilgamesh attain the meaning that is its reason for being. Love in this story is the vehicle of spiritual initiation, connecting Gilgamesh to the divine nature within him. <clears throat> when Gilgamesh travels across the waters of death and returns with the plant of immortality, he enacts a shamanic ritual as old as humanity itself, in which there is a profound self-transformation, and he thereby becomes a servant of the divine. Shamanism, the original spiritual tradition of humanity, is the art of relating to the spirit world and to the spirits whose home it is. And this ability is gained and developed through undergoing heroic initiatory experiences, quote, the great quest undertaken during a state of painful rapture, unquote. The importance of shamanism in ancient Mesopotamia can be seen in a list drawn up by one Sumerian temple scribe that ranked more than a hundred social attributes and functions by importance quote, descent to the netherworld, unquote, and, quote, ascent from the netherworld, unquote, are listed as 15th and 16th, following those of godship, kingship, several high priestly offices, and just after, quote, truth, unquote. <clears throat> Senleki Unini, the Babylonian poet of our version of the story, was himself a specialist in, quote, exorcism, unquote, in, quote, the way of the underworld and in control over demons, unquote. In the same shamanic way, Gilgamesh makes the descent to and return from the spirit world and gains more than mere, quote, control over a demon, unquote, the companionship and guidance of his dead lover's ghost. Furthermore, he gains a symbolic union with the god of wisdom himself, Father Enki. This crowning achievement, the fruit of his quest, is spelled out clearly in the very first words of the prologue. There, the poet, summarizing the entire story for his listeners, says, first, it is about a man, quote, who saw the abyss, unquote. The abyss referred to is the Apsu, a sort of bottomless freshwater ocean that surrounds the earth. The lord of the Apsu was named Enki, god of the deep waters, the lord of spiritual wisdom. Indeed, the word Apsu also means, quote, the all, unquote, or everything. Thus, the man who saw the abyss is the one who journeyed to the source of wisdom in the spirit world. And indeed, the poet confirms that in the Apsu, Gilgamesh opened, opened, quote, the hidden places, unquote, and saw the, quote, secrets, unquote, of Enki. He became, quote, he who knew everything, unquote. He became, quote, as the Lord of Wisdom, unquote. And after achieving this initiated state, the poet adds, Gilgamesh was able to return from this ordeal with the knowledge he had gained there from, quote, the time before the flood, unquote. Gilgamesh is a myth of masculine initiation through love in which shamanic wisdom is gained. It is possible to rediscover the spirit world today, for according to Jung, it has always existed. It is an objective reality that lies inside the human psyche itself. It is the unconscious. Jung says the unconscious is, quote, an independent productive activity, unquote, such as, quote, its realm of experience is a self-contained world having its own reality of which we can only say that it affects us as we affect it, precisely what we say about our experience of the outer world. And just as material objects are the constituent elements of this world, so psychic factors constitute the objects of that other world. The idea of psychic objectivity is by no means a new discovery. It is, in fact, one of the earliest and most universal acquisitions of humanity. It is nothing less than the conviction as to the existence of a spirit world. The spirit world was certainly never an invention, in the sense that fire boring was an invention. It was far rather the experience, the conscious acceptance of a reality in no way inferior to that of the material world." Unquote. The spirit world lies in the unconscious. It is the source of images and dreams, of all the great and subtle feelings, desires, and ideals, princess, the quote, powers, unquote, and princess, that for people mold life and determine life's meanings. Shamanism was a means to relate to and integrate the unconscious. 
Today, the great gods and demons are falling from the subconscious in the form of feelings and images still in turn involve people. This is the psychological meaning of falling in love. It is to be grasped in the power of a god who lives in the depths of our own unconscious. A major value of old myths today lies in how they reveal this interior world and its workings. By exploring the old stories in a psychological way, new light can be shed on the roots of today's experiences. One can personalize an archetypal story and so enter on the shamanic journey of initiation as Gilgamesh did, and thereby penetrate to the depths of one's inner being, where the unconscious can be recounseled to attain a profound wholeness of personality. Gilgamesh is the role model for gaining a sort of spiritual co-kingship unquote within, which requires a transformation of the untempered personality that is Gilgamesh at the start. As the story opens, he is king in name, but irresponsible, dissolute, lustful, petty, and destructive, lacking any higher purpose or goal in life than to carouse, fire, have sex. Not only is Gilgamesh incompetent as king, but he insults and degrades the people in his own divine nature, thereby mocking the gods who made him. Such a man is deeply unaware of who he is or should be, and behaves in the world by acting out his undifferentiated feelings and urges blindly and ruthlessly. Gilgamesh has become a man physically and by rank, but his ego personality, its libidinal organization, is still selfishly infantile. He thinks only of his own needs. He takes but does not give back. He relates to others only to use them, while his awareness is narrow and limited. He lacks insight. He is unconscious of himself. He does not know his own soul. To gain the kingship of spiritual initiation requires transformation of the untempered personality through a, quote, dark night sea journey, unquote. Gilgamesh is born unique, peerless, a paragon in potentia, an archetype, fully realized he is the, quote, joy woe man, unquote. That is, the uniter of the opposites within himself, achiever of an inner wholeness. As the Hindu sage Ramakrishna has commented, quote, He who knows darkness also knows light. He who knows night also knows day. He who knows happiness also knows misery, unquote. That's in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. The conscious development and unity of all the disparate aspects of the whole self, from the animal to the divine, is the kingship attainable by the spiritual seeker, the shaman and his descendants. Uh, princes, for example, the magician, the mystic, the gnostic, the alchemist, etc., and princes, whose kingship, quote, lies in being answerable to no human power, no chieftain or totem clan. <coughs> he is alone with the supernatural beings who have claimed him as their instrument, unquote. To achieve this goal, the novice must go on a long quest and experience the mysteries of love and death within. Thereby, the contending parts and potentials in his psyche are brought forward into a uniquely unified expression of the will of God. This is the process of personality development that Jung has called individuation, quote, the process of forming and specializing the individual nature, unquote, as a uniquely personalized expression of the sacred spirit. The Gilgamesh of the story's beginning represents the man who has not yet found himself, who is unaware of his inner spiritual nature and destiny. The Gilgamesh of the end is self-aware, whole and complete, his destiny fulfilled. The story of Gilgamesh, therefore, is revealing of the deep psychology of masculine romantic love, as it relates to adult psychological maturation. The figures and motifs of the story are symbolic of, quote, psychic factors, unquote, in the unconscious, involved with love's experience as an inward journey, the journey of individuation. They reveal the meaning and goal of love between two men in the scheme of the gods, the numinous personalities of the unconscious. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's the first two sessions. I will complete the paper, which then I'll buy eight, eight other sections, uh, 50 pages, next time for next month. So